compared to the myth the historian clicks offer the public, by the time Jackson's command appeared on Schoolhouse Ridge in front of Bolivar Heights on September 13, 1862, the defensive positions Harper's Ferry offered the Union force concentrated there were reasonably fortified. Certainly so. When you keep in mind the extent of fortifications created by the contending forces at Bull Run, Shiloh, Cedar Mountain, Second Manassas, Antietam, Chancellorsville, and Gettysburg. At Bull Run, for example, Richardson's brigade, attached to Miles' division on the day of the battle, had spent the previous days posted on the crest of the hill overlooking Blackburn's Ford. But Richardson erected as an artificial defense for his brigade not much more than a barricade of logs across the road leading down to the ford. And when Jackson's brigade made a stand on Henry Hill against Hunter's division, charging at it, with Heinzelman's division behind and Tyler's crossing the stream to join with Hunter in the charge, it was Jackson's artillery line that broke the Union charges, not fortifications. It appears from the record that in January 1862, at a time when Nathaniel Banks was in command of what was then called the Department of Annapolis, Dixon Miles was posted at Baltimore with the responsibility to protect the line of the Baltimore-Ohio Railroad from a relay station to Point of Rocks, the railroad's end point of operation at that time due to the fact that the railroad bridge over the Potomac and Harper's Ferry was being rebuilt. In May 1862, Miles came under the command of John Dix, who assumed command of the department from Banks after Lincoln on May 17th and made him the ranking Major General of Volunteers. When the Potomac Bridge was completed in early April 1862, Miles removed his headquarters to Harper's Ferry. He brought with him some 2,400 men organized as infantry and cavalry. The majority of the infantry were organized in three regiments. The 10th Maine, 60th New York, and the 54th Pennsylvania. The rest of the infantry were composed of the 1st Maryland Regiment and three companies of the 4th Maryland. Immediately upon these troops arriving at the ferry, they were sent forward along with the cavalry units to different posts on the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, the Winchester and Potomac Railroad, and at Winchester, leaving Miles and the three officers of his staff essentially alone at the ferry. In May 1862, the 10th Maine became attached to William's division of Banks's corps, which itself had been detached from McClellan's army with the objective of occupying Winchester and holding the lower valley. In June 1862, with Lincoln's reorganization of his operational plan for Virginia, Banks' Corps, now enlarged to two divisions with the addition of Siegel's, became consolidated with Pope's short-lived Army of Virginia. The companies of the 54th Pennsylvania Regiment, for its part, were posted at various points on the railroad from St. John's Run to Pawpaw until after the Battle of Antietam. The 60th New York held posts along the Winchester and Potomac Railroad until Jackson's appearance in the Lower Valley on May 25 when it retreated to the ferry and participated in the defense on May 29, 30. When Jackson retreated toward Strasburg, the 60th New York was attached to Banks' Corps, going with the Corps in June to the east side of the Blue Ridge. 
As for the 1st and 4th Maryland troops, these troops had been organized by Maryland Governor Hicks in belated response to Lincoln's call for militia quotas of troops, with Hicks imposing the qualification that they were not to operate outside the borders of Maryland. As a consequence of this, Miles posted them on the Maryland side of the Potomac. The conclusion most reasonable persons can be expected to draw from this is that the military function of Miles' presence at Harpers Ferry was limited to the function of supervising troops guarding the lines of the two railroads as opposed to the function of supervising a garrison manning a fort. Notwithstanding this, when Miles arrived at the ferry, he found that the Confederates, who had occupied the place for a considerable time in the spring and summer of 1861, had created a substantial defensive line along the crest of Bolivar Heights, with several redoubts included in the line for artillery positions. In addition to this, the Confederates had begun the construction of a substantial stockade structure on Elk Ridge, in the course of which many trees had been felled to supply the material of construction. And most important to any thinking person was the fact that when Miles arrived, he found that a large area on the crown of Loudoun Heights, some 1,200 yards in length and 300 yards in width, had been cleared of trees, and several stone fort-like structures had been erected where wagon roads crossed over the mountain. We might reasonably assume, but cannot know with certainty, the record so far disclosed being silent on the point, that Miles may have gained control of a Negro workforce which he used to enlarge the trenches found on Bolivar Heights and to excavate a line of similar trenches girdling the slopes of Camp Hill, considered at that time to be the position's bastion. Adding to the defense plan an encircling barricade of felled trees. That this is so, we know from the diary of a soldier named Robert McPhee a member of the 12th New York State Militia who arrived at the ferry on June 19, 1862 and reported observing these things. What confirms the limited military function entrusted to Colonel Miles at Arpus Ferry is the fact that in reaction to Jackson's appearance in the Lower Valley, in May 1862, Lincoln immediately cobbled together a military force independent of Dix's Department of Maryland and sent it by train to the ferry with four brigadier generals of volunteers to command the defense of the place. Rufus Saxton was in supreme command of two brigades, one of which was commanded by James Cooper a Pennsylvania politician who arrived with five regiments and the other by John Swuff, an Ohio politician who appeared from the west at Washington in May and was made a brigadier general and sent to the ferry with four regiments. A fourth brigadier, a man named Hamilton, who had commanded a brigade in McClellan's army in April, but was relieved of duty, was in Washington at the time Jackson appeared in the valley, and Lincoln sent him to assist Saxton. But Saxton resented his presence, and he returned to Washington before the engagement occurred. As soon as Jackson retreated from the Potomac, both Cooper's and Sloth's brigades became a division in Banks's corps under the command of Franz Siegel and moved in pursuit of Jackson up the valley 
leaving Miles at the ferry with Colonel Malsby's 1st Maryland Regiment and two recently mustered regiments, the 22nd and 12th New York State Militia Regiments, which arrived at the ferry in the middle of June 1862, as Lincoln sent Dix to command at Fort Monroe and had John Wool assume command of what now Lincoln was calling the Middle Department. In late July, a 4th Regiment, the 87th Ohio, came under Miles' command, but by September 2, 1862, only the 12th New York, the 87th Ohio, and Malsby's Maryland has remained. Of these, the three-month term of enlistment of both the 12th New York and the 87th Ohio had expired. The men of the 12th New York, trapped by the Confederate armies crossing the Potomac on September 4, refused to shoulder arms during the crisis, while the men of the 87th continued to defend the flag. The 27th, the 22nd New York State Militia, whose term had ended in August, had escaped the ferry on August the 30th and was in New York by September the 4th. Given the situation shown by the record, it is reasonable to conclude that during the period June 1 to August 30, Colonel Dixon Miles caused the existing fortifications that he inherited from both the Confederate occupation of the spring and summer of 61 and the work done by Saxon's command in May of 62 to be strengthened as best he could with what Negro laborers he had control of. Though, as to this, the available record does not show whether any such laborers were available. There is no evidence of payment chits. There is no evidence of messages that describe the presence of such laborers during this time. Although there is one message in the, in the rebellion record from Miles to Malsley asking Malsley to scour Pleasant Valley for such laborers, but Malsley's response is not recorded. However he did it, the record does show that while his cavalry and infantry were scattered along the railroads during this time, Miles still managed to plant a substantial amount of artillery on Camp Hill. This is shown by a message that General Wool suppressed from the record. Miles sent him in July. And Miles cleared a swath of ground on Elk Ridge some 100 yards in depth with a breastwork of felled trees behind it some 60 yards in width with a barricade established across the Sharpsburg Harpers Ferry Road extending eastward in front of the heavy artillery battery on the slope of the mountain. From this objective view of the situation that Colonel Miles was dealing with, most reasonable persons ought to grasp the fact that the claim made by the three officers Lincoln assigned to Judge Miles after his death, in which the historian clicks parrot, the Colonel Miles' failure to develop more fortifications was an efficient cause of the surrender, lacks a substantial basis in the evidence. Something distinctly different than this must explain the surrender. Something involving the minds of men whose circumstances call upon for action.